Hello. In this video, we are going to sketch out molecular orbital diagrams for the homonuclear diatomic molecules and ions at the right hand side, the end, of the second row of the periodic table. First, we want to look at dioxygen O2. The atomic orbitals of each of the two oxygen atoms are 1s, 2s, and 2p atomic orbitals. Also recall that oxygen has eight electrons, the 1s orbitals on each oxygen atom overlap to form a lower energy bonding combination, which we call sigma and a higher energy antibonding combination, which we call sigma star. And we can number them one. Similarly, the two s orbitals on each oxygen atom will overlap constructively to form a lower energy bonding combination, which we denote two sigma, and an antibonding destructive interference, higher energy antibonding orbital, which we denote as two sigma star. Now, once we get to the overlap of the two p orbitals, we notice something quite different from the earlier members of the second row of the periodic table. The lowest energy combination for the overlap of the two p orbitals is now going to be a sigma orbital, followed by the two pi orbitals. So effectively, it looks as if the sigma and pi combinations for the overlap of the two p's have switched. The reason for this is that as we increase the nuclear charge going from left to right across the periodic table, the energies of all the molecular orbitals will drop. But it turns out that the energy of the three sigma actually drops faster than do the energies of the three pi. And that is why it looks effectively as if the three sigma and the three pi orbitals have swap positions. Then we have higher energy antibonding combinations, which are exactly as before. So we have four pi star, four pi star, and then the highest energy is going to be four sigma star. So we notice that this style of MO diagram uh, is different than the early parts of the periodic table. And this will be the same style of diagram for all the ions of oxygen and for the compound difluorine. So again, we can highlight from which atomic orbitals the molecular orbitals are formed. Even if it isn't obvious by the way I've sketched this in, keep in mind that the bonding orbitals will always be lower in energy than the atomic orbitals from which they came. It may be a little hard to see this because of the way I've drawn it here, but the three, sig the three pi and the three sigma are all lower in energy than the two p orbitals from which they're constructed. And the four pi star and the four sigma star are higher in energy than the two p atomic orbitals from which they were formed. Next, we note that we have a total of 16 electrons in our system, and now we begin to put the 16 electrons into the molecular orbitals, starting from the bottom and working our way up, again using the alpha principle, which guides us until we get up to three sigma, and now we reach the stage of the three pi. Again, we have to apply Hunt's first rule, the first electron goes the second electron has to go into a different orbital, but with a parallel spin. The next two electrons finish up and fill up 
those two particular orbitals. So now we have 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14 electrons. So we have two electrons left. So again, applying Hunt's rule, we put one electron in 4 pi star and the other electron in the other 4 pi star. So now we want to calculate the bond order for this particular species. We notice that we have 2, 4, 6, 8, 10 bonding electrons, and we have 2, 4, 5, 6 antibonding electrons. 10 minus 6 equals 4. We take one half of that, which gives us a bond order O2. So this is consistent with our image of O2 being held together by an oxygen-oxygen double bond. And we would see that in if we drew out the Lewis dot structure. But one thing which the Lewis dot structure does not tell us and does not indicate to us that O2 has two unpaired electrons. So O2 is paramagnetic. If it has one or more unpaired electrons, it's paramagnetic. And since the total spin here is one, we have a half plus a half, that gives us a spin multiplicity of three. Therefore, oxygen, O2, in the atmosphere is a ground state triplet. And the fact that it's a ground state triplet is of tremendous importance because the fact that when it reacts with most organic compounds, which are singlets, the reaction is spin forbidden and therefore less likely to occur than it would otherwise. Now, this is the drawing for the ground state of oxygen. We can also form, if we put energy into the system, we can form excited states. One of the excited states would involve putting the electron in this orbital, but in the opposite direction. Now the overall spin is zero, and we have a spin multiplicity of one. This is referred to as singlet oxygen. Singlet oxygen is extraordinarily reactive, both because it's in an excited state, and also because its reactions with organic compounds will not be spin forbidden. This is one of the two possibilities for singlet oxygen. We can also form another excited state, which we call singlet oxygen, where we put the last electron paired up in this orbital. Now recall, I want to emphasize this point. When we apply Hunt's rule, Hunt's rule gives us the ground state, the lowest possible energy. It does not exclude possible excited states. And we see in this case um, that two of the excited states of oxygen are singlets, and they're of incredible importance in synthesis and in nature. So. Now suppose that I wanted to investigate the effect of removing one electron from dioxygen. Therefore, we would end up producing O2 with a plus one charge. It would start with 16 electrons, but we would have to remove one of the electrons. So, remove the, one of the high energy electrons here, which gives us a total of 15, which is the proper number. In this case, we can again calculate the bond order. So the number of bonding electrons is two, four, six, eight, ten. 10. The number of antibonding electrons is now two, four, five. So 10 minus five is five. Take one half and we have a bond order of two and a half. And we see that if we remove one electron from O2, we actually increase the bond order, which would mean that the oxygen-oxygen bond strength is increased and it's shorter than it would have been in the neutral compound. This may seem paradoxical in the sense that we think of electrons as holding the nuclei together, as sort of being the glue that holds it together, and that the more electrons involved in bonding would increase the bond strength. Here we see that the molecular orbital theory actually correctly gives us the right answer that removing one electron from O2 actually increases the bond strength. And we can understand that why, because the one electron we removed is from an antibonding orbital. So if we remove electrons from antibonding orbitals, it has the same virtual effect as adding electron to a bonding orbital. Now suppose we go back to our neutral molecule, we have O2, and we can put our electron back to where it was. Okay. And now we want to look at the effect of add, adding one electron 
2O2 to make O2 minus. O2 minus is an incredibly important species in biological systems called superoxide. And it's incredibly important because it is reactive and it's implicated as a cause of disease. Since we started with 16 electrons and now we have a minus one charge, we need to add one more electron. So we can put it either to orbitals here and we have the correct number of electrons and the correct MO diagram. With that in mind, let's calculate the bond order for superoxide. How many bonding electrons do we have? Well, we have two, four, six, eight, ten. How many antibonding electrons do we have? We have two, four, six, seven. Ten minus seven equals three. Divided by two gives us a bond order of 1.5. So we see that if we add an electron to O2, we've reduced the bond order from 2 to 1.5. So we can think of two reasons why superoxide is particularly reactive. On one hand, it has one unpaired electron, one unpaired electron, so it is a free radical, and also the oxygen-oxygen bond strength has been reduced from what it was in ordinary dioxygen. And for one last example, what do we get if we added two electrons to dioxygen? So now we form the peroxide ion. If we add in the last electron that we've added there, we have now filled up the four pi star levels. And let us now see what the bond order for this species is. The number of bonding electrons is 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. The number of antibonding electrons is 2, 4, 6, 8. 10 minus 8 equals 2 divided by 2 gives us a bond order of 1, which is exactly what we would predict from our knowledge of Lewis Langmuir's theory for peroxide. And we know that peroxide features an oxygen-oxygen -oxygen single bond, which is very, very weak and is easily cleaved homolytically to form, for example, in, if you start with hydrogen peroxide, you end up with two free radicals of OH dot, or hydroxyl free radical. And last but not least, for the second row of the periodic table, as far as homonuclear diatomic molecules, we want to look at difluorine. So difluorine is the way we generally think of fluorine in the atomic state. It's a gas. One difference from oxygen to fluorine is fluorine has nine electrons, whereas oxygen only has eight. So now we have a total of 18 electrons in our system. And we double check that we actually have 18 electrons here. We have two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18. And we notice something immediately. If we just concentrate on the MO diagram, we notice that F2, difluorine, has exactly the same number of electrons in the same types of molecular orbitals as O2, 2 minus hydrogen peroxide ion. So therefore, we can say that difluorine and peroxide ion are isoelectronic. If we recalculate the bond order, we'll find out, just as we did for peroxide, that the bond order of F2 is 1, which again is consistent with our predictions in Lewis Langmuir theory that F2 consists of a fluorine-fluorine single bond. And this again accounts for one of the reasons why fluorine is particularly reactive. The fluorine-fluorine bond is long, it's weak, it's easily cleaved, and we know that fluorine itself is the most electronegative of all the elements. So combine all those things together, and F2 we would predict to be uh, chemically stable, but extraordinarily reactive under many, many circumstances. I thank you very much for your attention. Have a good one.